Hello and welcome to Kiss My Arts. My name is Mary Blake and I'm here at home to present um, the Leitrim Arts Show with Leitrim Daily. I have a very special guest for you today. I have Fanula Maxwell, well-known traditional singer from County Leitrim. Hello Fanula and welcome to the show. Hello Mary, thank you very much. Great to be here. Yes, and as people can tell, we are not in the studio. We are still under lockdown restrictions, but we're doing our best to get a show out to you. And um, Fanula's at home and I'm at home and um, you'll forgive our crackles and um, little wobbles, but we're, we're, we'll, we'll keep the show on the road, as the man says. Fanula, people will know you in the Leitrim area and beyond as a traditional singer. So can you tell me a little bit about your earliest memories of song and singing growing up in Leitrim? Sure, I can, Mary. Yet yeah, my earliest memories probably are of, I would say, um, the butcher's sessions, which were in Drumsna, um, which in the times when children were allowed to be in the pubs after hours, I would have heard lots of music, um, a little bit of singing. That's probably where the, I first heard my own grandfather sing as well. My mother was always singing at home too. Um, but really, to get into the traditional side of things, I think it was more the flat kiolas that started it. There was a flat kiol in Drumsna, and I think I was about seven or eight, and I was singing in competition, and nobody had entered. Uh, and I was sitting in the audience waiting for somebody, and they said, go on up, go and sing a song. So up I went and sang something very simple. I, I think it was Sean Ina or Roher, uh, which was a four-line song. And basically was told, here, why don't you go and learn this song? And it was the Shores of Loch Bram that they advised. And off I went and realised that my own grand aunt had sung this song, my aunt sings and so on. And that was the start, I suppose, of my journey of travelling around to flas and feshes and workshops and everything else for traditional singing. And the shores of Loch Bran, I mean, you couldn't get a, a better song to start any anyone out singing with. And such a Leitrim song and, and a beautiful melody. Um, did you find that the you that going into competitions was good for your confidence, good for your voice, good for your singing or not? There are pros and cons to competitions, I know. Oh, yeah. There are pros, and I see it now, I can see it. It probably, I think it was nearly the only way, and in some ways it was the only way to get exposure at that time. I think there was an awful lot of, um, that say, radio and cassette tapes and onto CDs had taken over in terms of they were very popular. Everybody wanted to get their hands on them. So to hear traditional singing or to get a chance to actually sing that stuff, there wasn't much opportunity. So it wasn't about really the competition. I have to say now, my parents weren't those that were whipping me in the bathroom, waiting for me to win the medal. Um, they definitely brought me along to see what was going on. I think they thought it was probably good for my confidence. And I think it probably was too, because I think if I was asked now to stand up and sing in a competition, I'd be more nervous than I was then. So definitely there was none of that pressure to do it. Um, but I always felt, no more than climbing the likes of Crowpatrick, you always feel better after you've done it to say, well, I did it, but regardless of how you did. So I have to say it was a good start. And it probably, I think at that time, it probably was the only step at that stage that they could see into how I was going to be exposed to this type of thing. Yeah. And were there many other Leitrim singers that you were looking up to at that stage? Not, not a huge amount, to be very honest. Um, I think, again, because, and I, I, I think it's from my knowledge now, that we, we say traditional singing. And like anybody who sang the type of songs, say, that I look into or that I enjoy, um, they would never consider themselves to be traditional singers. They sang, and it was a tradition. So they sang in their kitchen. They sang in the, you know, in the, in the rambling houses. But I missed all that. that I, I'm, the, I'm the generation in between that. My parents, and my mother in particular, talked about her house would have been one of the rambling houses. And when she was growing up, the people came in and they played the fiddle and the accordion and that they danced around the kitchen and they sang songs and 
all of that. And I didn't have that. That, that era had gone. So I think there was that transition um, stage within that. And so for me to hear singers, I think I went further afield. I would have definitely gone more leaning towards the northern singers. I think maybe because their tradition had evolved a little bit more and they were strongly holding on to it and doing a lot of work on it. So the likes of Rosie Stewart and Paddy Tunney and those type of people, I would have listened to a huge amount then. And some of the Sligo singers then too. So um, Carmel Gunning and Colm O'Donnell. But again, um, you know, it wasn't as if you could just stream something like you can now. You had to go out and buy the cassette. And my mother was a great one for if we were at a flat, that she she had a little cassette tape at the time, like a little Walkman idea, and she would have taped a lot of singers. But the only thing being that a lot of songs that what I got from them years later, I didn't know who sang them. We didn't have the kind of maybe the knowledge to know to actually say who was singing them at the time or where we got them. But I still have them. Uh, and it was an early way maybe of collecting songs. And it's interesting that you talk about those singers, Rosie and uh, Carmel, and these re really beautiful singers that we, you know, were so enriched by have ha having had in this part of the country. Do you feel that their styles are, are different to our own Leitrim style? Or is there a Leitrim style of singing? Or is, have you made that now? Have you, have you kind of made your own space and your own individuality? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Mary, because actually I, I partook in a, a podcast series a couple of months back, again for Heritage Week with, the, with Leitrim County Council. And that was one of the questions I was asked about a Leitrim style. And it actually spurred me on to think, I, I couldn't answer the question, to be very honest, because I couldn't find a definitive answer to it. And I suppose that's part of the reason, you know, is because we relied on other traditions. Now, listening, I, I got a lot more into listening to the people around me and listening to older stuff that I found. And happily enough as well, I'm going to be doing research into this as I go on. And that's what spurred me on to think I need to look into this a lot closer to see what is the Leitrim style. Um, it's a question that I hope that within the next 12 months that after that I'll be able to answer. Oh, I hope you find out that we'll all be waiting for that answer because it is something that we are we are proud of our, our you know, us Leitrim people. And we have Leitrim songs and you have found Leitrim songs that we didn't know existed. And I'm fascinated by this. Can you tell me about any songs that you have kind of uprooted? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I found a great number of stuff. Um, what I'm actually doing at the moment, I'm trawling through the Dukas 1930s copy books um, and there's plenty of stuff in there just the, the reason just to, to rewind it back and the reason why I'm doing this I just um, I've recently received a bursary from the Arts Council to do all of this research for for this year so I'm really looking forward to all of this and I just started into sitting down and actually thinking gathering my thoughts and I have to get all this together and the things that have spurred that on are the likes of um, it was Polio was a song that I found that was sung by Thomas Moore who would have been Esalen Mohal area um, and he actually was a great character in that he was he was actually recorded by Seamus Ennis back in the 50s. But he was a man who never moved really far away from his own locality. But he had this huge amount of songs that had been sung all over the English speaking world. So Paulo was one that we got from that. And uh, Alex Southern Sutherland was another man. He was actually a fiddle player from Cary Gallen. And he in his collection of fiddle notes, he also had a couple of different songs in there. So interestingly enough, um, Michael Rooney's band is a song that I took from that um, and worked with Connor Ward on that and we put that song together. So there's been a few things like that. There have been other songs that I found lyrics to and I just, I love words. I love a story. I think ballads and traditional songs were always supposed to tell a story. So when I get that, I sometimes feel compelled. If I can't find the original air to it, I feel compelled at times to put an air to, to a song. So The Hills of Leitrim would have been one that I found in an American paper. Um, back in the early 1900s, it was printed by a man called Dickinson in that paper. And it was an emigration ballad, somebody looking back and having left their county. So that's what I'm drawn towards is the story, the history, what we can learn from our past through these songs. And that is so interesting that you find that um, and you know it's a song and not a poem. So do you, is it, have you been told that it's a song or are you just finding a poem and putting music to it? No, a lot of the time you'll actually, somebody will say this ballad was written, you'll actually have an introduction to it. 
I I do the I do know then again from reading and looking at stuff that some of those ballads, some of them are twenty verses long, and some of them actually were recited. Now I'm not sure whether they were recited because maybe the person who got the ballad might have thought their voice wasn't up to actually singing it. But um, to me, I, you can hear it, you can see it within the lyrics. Sometimes poems just don't fit to to music, and you can see that within them. And um, but the ones that I have used, uh, I generally see that they were written as songs, it's made note of, or written as ballads. Now, ballads, as I said, can be taken both ways. They could be recited by people too, but it depends on the structure of it. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I remember talking to you a few years ago at a FLA and um, oh, there were children I think you had prepared to go into competition and these little kids coming up and singing their song and it was so lovely. And you talking about how it was telling a story. And as a musician and a singer like you are, I was so happy to hear that, that it's the delivery. It's not always the beautiful voice. It's it's how they tell the story. And I think that then, you know, it, it is the music just a vehicle for the words then? Yeah, I, I have it um, on the head there, Mary, because that's exactly what uh, it's all about. Uh, go back to the thing where I say traditional singers, they didn't call themselves traditional singers. They called themselves singers. They told the story. They, th th that, was, that was the newspaper of the time. That was the radio of the time that brought the news. They were telling the story. So they didn't think, oh God, I better not sing this because I don't have a great voice. It was the, the delivery. Who got the story across the best? So traditional singing now isn't and shouldn't really be about um, again, who has the most beautiful voice that's been trained to sing that. You can't really train a traditional singer. You can guide them. You can give them songs. You can expose them to it. But you really have to develop your own style within this genre. And that's by listening to a lot of different stuff and seeing what sits well with you. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. It, it's it, And it's something that... So when you're teaching... So Fanula is teaching... Um, I suppose now with COVID times, you're teaching on Zoom, but, uh, you know, so you have a lot of young singers coming up. I see you with, you, you do with, with Carrick Trad classes and with um, Fred Finn, is it as well? You, you mm -hmm. do a bit of work, but so in that, so you are, what are you spotting in kids? Are you spotting um, that they're looking for the correct way to do it or are they looking to interpret? Um, it's interesting when you actually have them physically, and I, I had a, a lovely circle of singers um, that grew up early through Carrie Trad, and you could see it from the small ones to maybe if they spent three years at it, suddenly they were just acquiring the skills, they were acquiring their ornamentation, just by purely by listening and by practicing and singing for each other. Zoom, it's harder to do that, but yet, I have, lovely, I have two lovely classes, a uh, kids class and an adults class with friends at the moment on Zoom. And what I tend to do a lot of is go to the background of the song so I can share a PowerPoint with them and I can give them links towards different things with the kids. I can show them a little video about, we did about Halloween, we did Kilcannon the other day. And you can do the same with the adults, show them a little bit of the background. But I find that when they're on screen, there's a little bit more hesitation. It's more difficult to sing together. You can't do that on Zoom with a delay. But still, there still is that thing that they're a lot more attentive. So they listen a lot closer. And again, that bit of pressure makes them think about what they're doing. I also then put their songs on SoundCloud when they have done so they get to practice them and practice them with it. And I think it's just, it is, it's a, it's a process. It is a process. Uh, what some of them are, a lot of them are looking for is just to be able to pick up um, the skills that are required, to, not about perfecting it at all, but just being able to sing and being able to pick up these songs and to see what they can do with them. Others, you can see they're going a little bit more for, um, you know, how is this going to sound maybe within a competition or should I train my voice a little bit further? And oftentimes they'll move on maybe to another style of singing and that's fair enough. Maybe they don't, you know, they don't connect with the traditional thing in such a way. To me, when I see them, I think it enriches children in a lot of ways because not only does it give them like, um, you, know, you know, a chance to sing or a platform, but it also gives them huge patience. They learn things like reading skills and um, even social skills to be able to listen and wait for somebody. And also great discussions. I've had discussions with the, with the kids and classes in particular because they'll question things that maybe you never thought of yourself. And I think that's 
what a lot of parents actually feedback wise has said they really enjoyed that and they love the fact that you you explain something to them and they really got into it and i think for me a lot of parents are seeing the value and the work of that now mm. and the value is outside the musicality as well it's not it's, it's about their culture and their heritage and that whole being together and learning from each other it's so it's so valuable and i suppose there wouldn't really be a right way or a wrong way to sing a song either would there Fanula? Not at all. And I think I think that's what they love as well, because you're not saying go back over that line again because you got a little bit of that note wrong. In fact, sometimes um, you can write things off as a variation. You know, uh, so if you've got a little half note here, which is what that's why these songs were so notoriously difficult to notate was because if somebody was sent out, say the likes of Bunting or whoever sent out to notate these songs, that they listened to some one person playing them or singing them, but that one person had their their variations and had their ornamentation. They had to try and notate all of that in there. So it can be quite difficult to do that, to notate it through. So yeah, I'd say there's no wrong way, no right way. You will find, and they, I'll always say this to people that I'm teaching, you will find some songs you like, some songs that just sit with you, some songs that mean something to you and that sound good in, you know, when you sing them, whereas others you just might find they're not my type of song. You might enjoy them and you might love listening to them and love the story of them and you learn loads from that, but you will find people always then take, again, what suits them and what they feel works for them. And it's like getting putting on a comfortable pair of shoes when you find the you know the right song for you. You know it sits with your personality as well as your vocal range. I suppose. Oh, absolutely, mm. personality usually. And you can see that sometimes I actually say to some of them, "I found a great song for you," because I you know if you know them, you can say, "All right, this is a great." Or you, I might make a little note and go, "That would be great for such and such," because you can get to know what they like singing as well. Yeah. Brilliant. It's brilliant because it is so individual. Even the same song can be delivered so differently. It's like tunes, you know, in different parts of the country and different, uh, you know, adaptations of them. It's brilliant. And you're you had a very productive lockdown time, Fanula, with lovely residents of the Drumsna area. Can you tell us a bit about that? Absolutely. Well, I tell you, back in March, I suppose when we had our first lockdown, as they're calling it now, um, I was a teacher, I'm a school teacher as well. So I was, God, I was sitting at a table teaching kids on a computer with my own kids behind me and another laptop and a little one sitting, a three year old sitting watching cartoons. And it was all very full on. Um, but the, the arts office um, in Carrick and Shannon, again, and to give them great credit, they're, they're very supportive of stuff. Um, they were kind of on the lookout for somebody because a lot of their projects depended on being able to have contact with people. And that lockdown, I felt, happened just like that. And it dropped a lot of people in it. So they were looking for projects that could be maybe adapted to this new reality that we had. Basically, cocooning people of a certain age or illness or anything else could not go anywhere. And I think there was more fear in, in that first lockdown because it was a total unknown um, to us. Now, the weather was good, which it was a bonus to us. But I just felt um, my own kids, they, they could contact their friends. They can snap and they can do all this and it's no bother. So I felt I didn't really feel that sorry for them because they could always contact their friends um, at, the, at the touch of a button. And my thoughts went really to the older generation who wouldn't be set up with them um, with the likes of their their mobiles and their computers and and Zoom and other technology we have now? So I decided I was going to challenge myself if, if the arts office would take it on as a project to try and find some of those cocooning citizens to join me on Zoom. Um, and obviously the challenge, the first challenge of that was to actually make sure people had Wi-Fi, had internet, you know, rural Leitrim, it's not that easy. And then secondly, that they, they had access, that we would have maybe somebody or that they would be able to guide them towards setting this up, that we would work with Zoom. So what I did was I, pro I approached, I, I got um, I got a, uh, an agreement to the project. They, they were delighted to go with it. And I approached, first of all, the uh, resource centre in Drumsna because I know they were busy out doing their meals and wheels. And I know a lot of the residents around used to go in for their daycare in there. They'd have games of cards and they'd meet. And it was a great social hub. And uh, so I just approached there that I could get a couple of contact details for some of them. And that was, it proved difficult. Um, obviously, the challenge uh, was to find people who would be able to access this and have Wi-Fi and everything else. 
So it did prove difficult at the start. So I got two residents from there who were kind of the, the anchor people. They, they met each, um, I think it was Tuesday and Wednesday, they used to meet in there and play cards. And then I went and just sent a, a message out to people in the area about people that I thought might be interested in the project again, who'd be cocooning, that I could say, look, it's Zoom, your son or daughter maybe could set it up for you, or I can guide you through it. So we ended up getting six uh, candidates and myself, which was just a lovely number. And we used to meet every Thursday evening on Zoom for six weeks we spent. And we got it back to the future through memories and songs because they were basically going back. I was going to try to bring them back through the songs and their memories. Uh, but we were definitely going towards the future because they were getting to use Zoom and to be on a computer and to get a bit of a bit techie, if you like, even though some of them used to look at the camera and go, don't touch anything because if I touch a switch, it'll all go off. But it was great fun. Um, it was definitely a two-way learning thing in that they learned a huge amount technology-wise, but I learned a huge amount as well about them and about their backgrounds and about the area that I live in because they all live around me as well. So um, the process was, Mary, on a Sunday evening, I would send them a snippet of a song or a poem or a few different things put together. So it could be something like... Um, you know, courting in the kitchen and we talk about the tradition of going to weddings and what they were like years ago or the dragging home after weddings. It was cures and stories from their childhood, from school and what they remembered. Um, even hard times as well. There's a lot of talk about hard times and how difficult things were years back. Um, and as they were going through, I got the permission to record them as well for each of those sessions. So um, it was brilliant. And I have to say, I got so much out of it. We had Charlie McGettigan too. He, he was so kind to come on one of the evenings and sang a few songs. And we did sing songs together. And uh, it was just lovely. It was lovely. And it broke up that cocooning, that, that lockdown period for me and for them. Enjoy it. It's, it's an absolutely beautiful uh, piece of work, Fanula. Congratulations. It really is lovely. And it's lovely because it's so sincere. And they're themselves. And we all can identify with them. We all know people like that. If we don't actually even, we, we'd know some of them personally, but we, we really know these characters. And even as they were telling about their cures and everything, they were kind of going, oh, shut up, daft. But, you know, but it was, it was just a lovely little, um, it's so important. And it's you said our people are our heritage and we get so caught up in our heritage and our music and our art and all these beautiful important things but really it's these people and it was actually quite moving actually to see these people and show pictures of them as as young youngsters and um you know they still had the same personalities they, they were great crack honest to god it was lovely and you got an award for that Fanula. I did. Well, I took I took the clips and then I edited and cut it down and decided when Heritage Week came along, they were looking, obviously, again, it didn't happen festival-wise and it was a load of stuff that I'd say people had put a huge amount of work into, it couldn't happen. And I said, sure, I'll make this up uh, into a Zoom film, a compilation kind of film, and uh, entered it for the awards. And yeah, I won the County Leitrim Heritage Award, which I've never never entered it or anything else before and it was look it was a very good experience in that as you say there our people are our heritage and our songs are our heritage and I don't know if we focus enough on that and on other aspects too we kind of tend to think that it's you know nearly always about say a building or you know about one specific event in history whereas it's all history it's all heritage so I think yes. it was lovely to just have that acknowledged as well. Yeah and to recognize these brilliant people and these gas characters and old stories that are you know and even I had heard some of them before um from my own parents and grandparents but then you hear it again you go god I had forgotten that old scale but you know it is so important to document as well and I remember you saying some time ago um tradition is about fanning the flames not worshipping the ashes did it was it you I saw? I think you had it up on Facebook or something. I think that is exactly it in a nutshell. Yeah, and so, and I so I so believe in that. I do think that it definitely. I mean, what's tradition if it's gone? If it's left to you know to to be there and look at in a dusty shelf? I think you know it, tradition. It, it had if it had to be continued if it's going to be a tradition. So that's my take on it anyhow. And. You know, this was just a new way. Like I've never, I those people would never come to a class 
they never come to a you know to a singing class. So therefore, this is just another way as well of um, you know seeing how those songs linked everything. They were all about those traditions. So for me. I learned so much as well about the songs, about the background. There was one about a pattern day, for example, and uh, I didn't, I'd never heard of a pattern day um, until they described that, you know, when the patron saint was and that these are kind of turned into parties. So there was a huge amount of learning for me within that as well. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's fabulous um, to have all that history. And as you say, they were brilliant, great people. And the funny thing, though, was at the very end, uh, the last kind of looking back when I asked them, even though there was a lot of talk of hard times and that, you know, that they had it tough and when they were children, they, none of them wanted to be young in these times. None of them said, yes, I'd love to be young and growing up in this year. They all said their times were much simpler, much nicer. And despite all all the, you know, the hardship or poverty or anything else that they'd gone through, they still reckoned that um, times were better. For them. Now, I don't know if we'll all say the same, maybe when we look back, but that was their consensus. Times were better for them, despite money and not having it and everything else. And all the things that were um, hard were just physical things. They were just cold or, you know, or what, it wasn't the same intensity of pressure that some young people feel now and you know that's why we love to give young people outlets through um like your music classes and their drama classes and their dancing classes and whatever else you know we try to somehow give them respite from the pressures of the world which is shocking really that we've that we have to create a a, a cure for for the wonderful world we live in but um it is where we are you do also um, teach in the summer schools. Yep, yeah, I do. Um, obviously, again, we didn't have that this year. So, you know, that was, um, it, it, for me, it kind of spurred me on to go and do something else, go and do more. I still have a great link, have a great time. So I would teach um, from Joe Mooney School and uh, he do um, Harp Fest, he, he do summer school as well. I do some and things like that. And I've met some brilliant people through that and harking back to earlier when you asked about um, growing up and you know outlets for singing and who you listen to when there, while there wasn't that much for me at that stage now I found a whole community of people all these singing sessions and all those but I, and people I've met through those summer schools they all have singing sessions online now so you can go on and you can be singing with a group from Dublin or a group from Wexford and um, I suppose for me it's it's great because I wouldn't normally get like you know kids going up. It wasn't the thing. You just wouldn't get away. You had to, it was like a military operation to try and get to these singing sessions all the time. So it's nice to be able to tune in and hear lots of that. So I think I've heard more singing than I ever have had um, over lockdown, which seems a bit ironic in a way. Uh, but it's one of the things that kind of spurred me on as well, just to look at what I do. Um, you know, it's funny because after doing the, the Zoom compilation, the Zoom project, I felt like because people were talking about what's your arts practice rather than it being, you know, what about your singing? Um, it changed my perspective on what I was doing. Uh, and because I couldn't teach these classes, again, it changed what, what can I do? Can I take time now and sit and look and see what I can do? And, it, and that through that, um, I got engaged in a number of, of interesting projects um, just to, to say, right, where, where do I go to? How can I, how can I explore this? And one of them actually was um, a co-create project that myself and um, Kate Martha Sheridan are working on. Um, we, we started off with, um, so back in March, of, it was, yeah, it was March, just before the lockdown, I was doing a Jenny Put the Kettle On series talk with um, Vincent Woods. So uh, yeah. was where people are being introduced to their, their local artists and stuff. So myself and John Toohey were the guests that night, and John Toohey's a great piper. Um, and John's partner, so Kate approached me afterwards, and she because I was chatting about childhood songs and things like that. She had a huge interest in that. Um, and she's a, a ceramicist and a visual artist. And she said, will we apply and see to the co-create filming this with the Leitrim Design House? So we did that, and we ended up getting it. And we had a great somewhere um, again of exploring this and um, looking at exploring sounds within paintings and art and uh, my young fella even bought a pottery wheel out of all this and we went off exploring through forests and woods to find Brian O'Lynn's house 
Uh, we talked about childhood rhymes and and all the rest, and we continue to we continue to work on it. We we're going to phase two with it, so and um, we're excited about that and uh, to see where that leads to. But it really made me stop and think: What do I do, and why? Why keep ploughing? Why keep going the one route that it was like the little road uh, less travelled? Maybe I need to take a few steps down that little road. So that was a lovely little project, Jenny put the kettle on, and you had a lot of collaborations there. And I suppose as a singer to be working with other with people with different art forms, that was quite interesting for you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think it was unusual, We um, even as we got our acceptance for the thing that they were staying within the design house, this is such an unusual combination to have a traditional singer and a visual artist. But to be honest, it worked really, really well. I think we just, we kind of bounced off each other. And even now um, we continue to kind of she Kate will ask questions that I never thought of if I'm if I'm singing a song and I vice versa. So she'll come up with new ideas and it's great to see interpretations too because her interpretation of a song, to see your song or to see a song you sing being interpreted it visually is is like it's amazing really. And I think that has worked so well. Um, and we hope to continue um with the project in it. So I'm looking forward to all that. So you are a busy woman. So not only have you this new bursary that you've been awarded, congratulations on that. And that's for all our benefits for Leitrim songs and music. It would be wonderful. Um, you have other projects on the go. What else is going on? Yeah, well, at the, we're just after yesterday. And this is like I've got my Friday evening head on me. Um, yesterday evening, we were out with the Modern Day Mummers project. So myself and the Duina Guckian and uh, Brian Mustard. We have been going around again. We started off as a sort of a trial uh, during the first um, lockdown, so in May, uh, to go around to sing a song, give a little dance, and play a tune for our cocooning citizens. We knock at the door, we play our tune, uh, they come to the door, we keep our social distance, and we bring in the song, the tune, and the dance. And it has continued. We were just out last night, actually, um, and RTE were filming us last night for a Creative Ireland uh, production as well. So that's all going well. We still have a couple of more to do, a couple more sessions, and we hope to continue it. And we've had a great response to that. People come out, not just for the song and the tune, the dance, but for the chat as well. It's just, you know, you can see it within people that they're missing company and missing just having a chat to see what's going on and what's new. And uh, I imagine the postmen are probably getting their ears bitten off the stage as well by anybody at all, if you can have a chat with them. So that's, that's what this has been all about too. So that's a lovely, lovely project as well. Lovely. So you're doing great work, Vanula. Really, thank you. We're very grateful to um to people like you and Edwina that you I know you work a lot with Edwina. You kind of have the same um work ethic. You know, you're like you keep busy and keep creative and keep giving to your community. So that is fantastic. And Brian Mostyn, of course, no, no show without Brian. It's great to see him involved and and, and join that. Have you a song for us, Fanula? I know we're a bit we're a bit crackly here, but um, could you throw a song out of you there? Yeah, sure, sure. I I do I do a short one for you because um, I don't say. But this is one actually that I was talking about the pattern of the fair. It's one that I I came across again, and that is funny when I sang it for a couple of people from around the area. It says oh, I remember that song. Um, geez, my father used to that or my grandfather used to sing it and so on uh, and so I thought god this is obviously a song so that was sung around the area it has many versions uh, but the version that I picked up is the Al Scalara hat so we'll give it a try for you Patsy Murphy brags about the hat his father wore no doubt it was a bright caffeine in the merry days of yore but just a hundred years ago and the devil the worst of that for a regular lady dazzler is me Oscalara hat. It was worn by my father at the patterns dance and fair, when all the boys and pretty girls were sure to be all there. It was built a hundred years ago, on the devil the worst of that. For a regular lady dazzler is me Oscalara hat. Oh, where did you get the hat, the collar and the tie? Isn't it a nice one? It's just the proper style. It was built a hundred years ago, and the devil the worst of that. For a regular lady, dazzler is me, Oscalara hat. It was worn by my father at the patterns dance and fair, when all the boys and pretty girls were sure to be all there. 
was built a hundred years ago, and the devil the worst of that. For a lady, lady dazzler is me, Oscar hat. Oh, I met the king of England a week ago today. He took me warmly by the hand and asked me how to stay. Oh, Pat says he, I'm glad to see you're looking so fine and fat. But all the time he's looking at me, out Galara hat. It was worn by my father at the Patterns Dance and Fair, when all the boys and pretty girls were sure to be all there. It was built a hundred years ago, and the devil the worst of that. For a regular lady dazzler is me, out Galara hat. Oh, <laughs> well done, Fanula. You never refuse a, an opportunity to sing. I'll say that for you. Fair play to you. Thanks a million. Hi. So come here. If anybody wants to hear, if anybody wants to look at that film, that Zoom film, check it out on YouTube. It's Back to the Future Through Memories and Song. And it's just a lovely film um, with, with some of our older residents from the community telling stories and singing songs and having a crack with Fanula. It's a lovely project. So as I said, best of luck with the with the research you're going to be doing really looking forward to coming back and chatting to us about that one i mean i hope you find some gems there for us and best of luck with all else you're doing and you have your cds your cds still on the go i'm sure sing a litrum song anybody who wants to pick that up i presume you're 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 still um able to be contacted through facebook so listen thanks a million fanula and thank you all for joining us on Leitrim Daily, Kiss My Arts. I'm Mary Blake, signing off. Bye.